Okay, everybody. So, um, tonight, tonight we're going to be talking about the concept of sinking the sun and the moon. Sinking with a C, <laughs> S Y, not S I N K. <laughs> um, Nat Geo Kabbalah. Oh, National Geographic Kabbalah. Ah, huh, really? That's interesting. That was on the History Channel, there was one, but. Um, uh huh. Alrighty. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about sinking the sun and the moon. Now, what do we mean by sinking the sun and the moon? Um, so, as everybody knows, uh, the generally the year, uh, certainly in the Western world, is based on the cycles of the sun, uh, as we've spoken about uh, previously, in fact. Um, and the solar year, which is a calendar that was fixed uh, hundreds of years ago already, the solar calendar has uh, approximately 365 and a quarter, is 365 and a quarter days long. Now, there are certain cultures and societies um, that go according to the lunar calendar. They don't follow the solar calendar, but the lunar calendar. For instance, uh, Islamic, uh, Islamic religion is uh, totally a lunar, um, a lunar religion and a lunar calendar, and uh, that's all that they follow. Now, in the Jewish tradition, we follow actually both of them. Uh, the lunar calendar and the solar calendar, depending on what things uh, we are looking at. So we have both calendars, and these calendars have to be synced because the solar year, as we said, is 365 and a quarter days approximately, and uh, the lunar year is 354. Yeah, there are the Igbo people in Nigeria also follow. That's interesting. Okay, very good. So. Um, yeah, there are a lot of people that uh, that do follow the lunar calendar. In fact, that was probably the more common calendar until um, really until the Roman Empire. I think that they they were the ones that eventually switched over to the solar. But um, <clears throat> in any event, uh, the the um, lunar year is three hundred fifty four days approximately, which is about eleven days shorter than the solar calendar. So therefore, you'll find in the Jewish calendar that every uh, just less than three years, um, there is an extra 30, there's more than 30 days, almost 33 days, separating the lunar and the solar calendar. And therefore, instead of having simply 12 months, an extra month is added into the Jewish calendar so that you get 13 months in some years. In fact, it's seven out of 19 years. In seven out of nine, in a 19 year cycle, seven of those years have to be um, leap years. Leap years isn't just one day, but it actually has an extra month. It's called in Hebrew, Shnat Ha'ibur, in a sense, the, the impregnated year, a year that's pregnant because it has an extra month. Now, um, the month that is added in is always only, uh, there's only one month, and that is the, um, the month of Adar. The month of Adar, the month that we are going to be going into in another few days. The Hebrew month of Adar. So this year, um, there will be two Adars, the first and the second. And the first Adar begins uh, next week. Um, on uh, Wednesday, I believe. Wednesday of next week is Rosh Chodesh. Is the first day uh, of uh, of Adar. <clears throat> now, the, um, the the way we, we the way Kabbalah looks at this is it, this is not simply a uh, a calendar thing. The reason for it, the reason for this. Let me make sure I'm recording. Yeah, uh, the reason for this is um, that there's a verse that says that the Passover has to be in the spring. So if the sages would see that um, there was still signs of winter around and the spring had not yet sprung, 
then they would add uh, they would add in a month and give it a little bit more time to develop. This was in the time when the um, the new month was dedicated and consecrated. Um, consecrated is the right word. Was consecrated by it was consecrated visually. In other words, when you would actually see the new moon after the moon faded out and it was completely a dark moon, then the first sliver of the new moon, there were witnesses that would come who saw it. They would come to Jerusalem, uh, to the uh, rabbinical court, the Sanhedrin, and they would proclaim that they saw, they would ask them all kinds of questions. Where do you see it? What did it look like? They had all kinds of, uh, they had very uh, vast astronomical knowledge and they knew uh, where it should be seen, in other words, in what direction it should be, uh, where it should rise, would, was it, you know, to the, um, uh, what, the what degrees of uh, north-south and so on and so forth uh, would, it, would it arise, um, and uh, what shape would it have been, would it have been a, uh, a crescent, an inverted crescent shape, would it be, um, you know, with the horns pointing down, so to speak, with the horns pointing up or to the side, they would know how it ought to be in order to be able to make sure the witnesses knew what they were talking about. So the ostensible reason is that the, um, the Passover had to be in the spring, and therefore the month before Passover, which is the pa Passover is in the month of Nisan, so the month before that, the month of Adar, was the critical month to find out if spring was in fact on the way. If it wasn't, they would add in another Adar. So you get the first and second Adar. That's the month. Okay, that's the ostensible reason for it. However, in Kabbalah, Kabbalah explains there's another reason for it entirely. Right in the beginning of creation, from right from the outset, the um, uh, Kabbalah explains, it's actually brought in the Midrash as well, uh, that there was a... Um, a kitrug. A kitrug means uh, it was sort of a um, uh, a complaint. Now, it's put in sort of in, in story form, but uh, we obviously can't, can't take the story form literally. It's, it's really a very deep secret. The story is that, the, that originally when God created the world, he created the two large luminaries. There's the small luminaries, the stars, and then there's the two large luminaries, the sun and the moon. And initially, the stature of the sun and the moon was identical. Their stature was identical. That is what the, uh, the Midrash says. Comes along Kabbalah and explains what this means. The sun and the moon represent, essentially, two different spiritual qualities. The sun represents the spiritual quality of giving, of giving out, of bringing light into a system, of, uh, of, um, uh, of what's called in, uh, in Hebrew, hashpa. It's the giver. However, the moon is the receiver. The moon receives reflected light from the sun. But the sages explain, and this is brought in Kabbalah as well, initially it wasn't like that, that the moon received the light and reflected the light of the sun. Initially the moon had its own light. It was also a source of the light just like the sun. But when he complained that there cannot be two kings wearing the same crown, two kings cannot wear the same crown, that was the complaint, so to speak, of the moon. Um, so uh, God said to the moon, so go and reduce yourself. In that case, go and reduce yourself. Now again, let's not take this um, in, uh, you know, in, in, in too uh, childish a fashion. What was going on here was that there were two sources, really two sources of energy. There were two sources of spiritual influence. One source of spiritual influence was that which generated energy. That which generated energy. The other form was also a generator of energy, but of a different kind. A different type of energy. If you could put it in, uh, in, in these terms, the generation of energy from the sun 
is a top to bottom model. The generation of energy from the moon is a bottom to top model. In Kabbalistic uh, terminology, milamala lamata, from above to below, is the sun, and um, the moon from below to above. So, which of these two forms of influence has more um, has has more influence on human beings. Initially, both of these were equal. They were equally balanced. The top-down sun model and the bottom-up moon model were equally balanced. So that a person, in order to uh, be able to live his life or her life in a proper way, would balance these two things equally. However, when the moon came to say you can't have two kings wearing the same crown, in other words, two kings doing the same thing, influencing the human soul, then God says to the moon, so let's make go and reduce yourself. In other words, now your light is not going to be something in which over which you essentially have, over which you have control per se, but it's going to be a reflected light. It's light from, it's a top-down light which you now receive and cause to grow. That you receive the light is not your own doing, but that you cause it to grow as we see the moon waxes until the middle of the month and it starts to wane again and it waxes again and wanes again. In other words, that concept of constancy, constantly giving out, which is the sun, the sun, even though there, there are variations in the, uh, in the energy that comes out of the sun, as we know, with the sunspots and so on and so forth, there is a variation, but more or less it's a steady, um, it's a steady flow. If it would be very unsteady, uh, we, wouldn't very, we, we wouldn't actually um, have life on earth probably. Um, but the moon, the, uh, as we know, the moon waxes and wanes and waxes and wanes. It's, in a, it's constantly, constantly in a state of flux. So these two things, therefore, these spiritual ideas of constancy and of flux are extremely important. Constancy takes precedence in a regular year over flux. However, flux or the bottom-up model takes precedence in leap years, in an Ibur Shana. And that's why the Kabbalists explain that it isn't only a, a, a calendar issue to make sure that the Passover is always in the spring. This is a spiritual issue as well. It is a tikkun a rectification, so to speak, for the moon to make it equal again to the sun, even though it goes out of sync again later on. But there is a time in which, during a leap year, it is equal to the sun, and in fact, even more than, because a, 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 a leap year, in a, a Jewish leap year, is usually uh, 383 days long. It's usually 383 days long which means it's longer than a solar year. And that in, essentially says, the, um, says uh, the Zohar is the Tikkun Halavana. That's the rectification of the moon. Now again, the Tikkun is such that it surpasses the solar year. And therefore, and uh, in some sense, during a um, during a leap year, the bottom-up model takes precedence and comes into full force in a leap year, rather than, a, 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 but much less so in a um, in a regular year. Now, what we've spoken about so far is only the concept of tikkun, as far as time is concerned, the tikkun of time. 
But there's also a tikkun of place and there's a tikkun of soul, a rectification of time. When we put the cycles of the moon and the sun into sync, we synchronize them. And then there's a tikkun of place as well, and then there will be a tikkun of soul, which we'll talk about in a minute, or in a few minutes. What's tikkun hamakom, tikkun of place? The word adar, uh, I'm going to write it here in the, uh, in the chat box. The word adar in English would be spelt, uh, adar would be spelt like that in the chat box, A-D-A-R. Or uh, in Hebrew, it would be Aleph Dalad Reish. Now, in Hebrew, if you separate the Aleph from the Dalad Reish, then you get what's called Aleph Dar. The letter Aleph, or the A in Adar, is dar, it dwells. Now, what does that mean? Uh, the, uh, the, word, um, the word adar in, um, when, when we separate the aleph and the dalad, the aleph represents, uh, the, the uh, sages tell us the aleph represents, the Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet that re represents the Alufo Shel Olam, or the Adon Olam, the master of the worlds, in other words, God. The Aleph represents God. And Dar means to dwell. So when the Almighty dwells in the world, in other words, when the presence of the Almighty is revealed in the world, that's called Aleph Dar. In uh, the Midrash, this is called Dira Betachtonim, a dwelling place in the lower worlds. God created all of the worlds because he wanted a dwelling place in the lower worlds, not in the higher worlds. The fact that godliness is revealed in the higher worlds is no, it's no Hiddush, there's no novelty, there's nothing special about that. That's the way it's expected to be. But that godliness can be revealed in the lower worlds, that is a chidush, that's a novelty. Where primarily is it revealed? It was revealed prim primarily in the tabernacle and in later on in the temple. The divine presence was revealed in the tabernacle and the temple. There were many, many miracle, miracles that, uh, that took place there, transcending nature without going to what those were, because it's not really relevant right now. The fact is that um, uh, that is in fact why the, the temple and the tabernacle were built, which is the discussion in this week's Torah reading called Truma. Pasha, uh, sorry, sorry this, this week is Pasha Mishpatim. Next week's Torah reading called Truma, which is uh, the, the um, gifts or the donations that people gave towards the building of the temple, gold and silver and copper and so on and so forth, all these things were given in the construction, they were given freely and willingly uh, by the people to uh, construct this house of God. And God dwells within it. Make for me a temple and I will dwell, the usual translation, therein, I will dwell therein. The divine presence was revealed in the uh, in the tabernacle and in the temple. However, uh, the the verse actually says "betocham," which means really within them. I will be revealed within them, and that comes to the third tikkun. So the second tikkun was the tikkun of place, that godliness should be revealed in the world, everywhere in the world, but particularly in one place the place that he chose, the place that he chose for his um, divine presence to be revealed. Doesn't mean to say it's not revealed elsewhere, or couldn't be revealed elsewhere, but there's a place where it's revealed constantly, and that was in the, uh, in the temple. Now that we don't have the temple anymore, it was destroyed, um, first by the Babylonians, then by the Romans. First temple by the Babylonians, second temple by the Romans. And we're waiting to build, rebuild the third one, uh, one of these days when uh, in the Messianic era, then we'll rebuild the temple. 
or before it. But those are the two, uh, the, the first two tikkunim, the tikkun of time and the tikkun on the rectification of place. But there's also a tikkun on nefesh. Now that we don't have the temple anymore, the tikkun of nefesh is the primary one, the tikkun of the soul. Now, what do, you mean when, what do we mean when we say the tikkun of the soul? The truth is that the soul itself does not require the Ariza, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, famous Kabbalist, uh, 1500s from Safed in Israel, Tzvat, explained that the soul itself does not need a tikkun. The soul is already perfected. The soul is part of God above and therefore doesn't need any tikkun. What needs a tikkun is the interface of the soul with the body, with the physical world. But in any event, God dwells within them, in other words, within each and every person. In the tabernacle inside a person is where the, um, where the, godliness, where the godliness dwells. Now, <clears throat> one thing about, uh, about the additional month of Adar, in fact, the additional month is the first month, is the additional month. The second month of Adar, the second Adar, is the regular month. That's the one that's closer to Passover, and that's the one in which we celebrate Purim. The first Adar, which is coming up in a few days, uh, we don't have, there's no particular festival involved, except what, what's called Purim Katon, minor Purim, in other words, it's not the real festival of Purim, which talks about the overthrow of Haman and the story of Esther and so on and so forth. But regarding this, there's a very interesting, um, there's a very interesting idea. The code of Jewish law, which tells a person how, how he's supposed to live, it's Jewish law doesn't mean just to say jurisprudence, it's the law of how to live. It's the, the rules by which we, uh, which we live and conduct our lives. So the, uh, the Shulchan Aruch, the code of Jewish law is divided into various sections. There's the first section which deals with basically everybody's life. With um, um, living in this world, celebrating the festivals, and so on and so forth, and how to live properly in this world, the laws of prayers, the laws of blessings, the laws of food and Sabbath and all those kinds of things, called Orach Chaim. Then there's um, uh, an, another section which is called Yoridea, which has to do with the laws of kosher, with the kosher laws. And then there's Ibn Ha'ezer, Ibn Ha'ezer, Ibn ha sorry, Ibn Ha'ezer, which uh, deals with the laws of marriage and, uh, and things like that. And then finally, there's the, um, what people would normally call jurisprudence, uh, which is the laws dealing with uh, financial transactions and so on and so forth. But the first one, the first section of the Shulchan Aruch that deals with life, and that last one is called Choshen Mishpat. So the, uh, the, uh, the laws that deal with life is called Orach Chaim, the way of life, essentially. Now, the beginning of the Shulchan Aruch the beginning of the code of Jewish law and the end of it, of this particular section that deals with everyday life, starts off with two verses. It starts off with a verse and it ends with a verse. And this will give us a clue as to really what Adar, this month that we're about to enter, is all about and what's sinking it in such a way that it transcends the solar month, how we how we sink how we sink this, and how we in, in fact rectify how we rectify the moon, how we rectify the the receptive or the passive or the uh, reflective aspect, so that it becomes dominant. So we do this by following the teachings of the first verse, which begins the section of the of the Jewish code of law, code of Jewish law, and the last verse with which it finishes. The first verse begins as follows: the first verse that that begins the the code of Jewish law called Orach Chaim, Shulchan Aruch Orach Chaim. It begins with a verse that says, "Shiviti Hashem lenegdi tamid." I place God before me always. 
And the last verse finishes off with the verse, Tov Lev Mishte Tamid. A person of good heart is always celebrating. Now, it used to be in the days of old, uh, when we had the temple, that we would bring the most important sacrifices um, on a regular basis were the two tamidim, the two constant sacrifices. They're called tamidim, the constant sacrifice, because they're brought every single day, every day. One in the morning, one in the, one in the uh, evening, towards evening. They were called the two tamidim, the two constant sacrifices, the two constant offerings. The morning offering and the afternoon or evening offering, afternoon the mincha, in the mincha time. So this was called the two tamidim, the tamid shel shachris, but tamid shel ben Arabayim, the morning offering and the dusk or pre-dusk offering. They're both called tamidim, tamid, because they're always brought. And the verse that begins, the first verse that begins the code of Jewish law, also has the word tamid constant in it. And the last verse, which closes Shulchan Aruch Orachayim, also has the word tamid. Again, Shiviti Hashem lenagdi lenegdi tamid. May I place God before me always. And Tov Lev Mishta Tamid, someone of a good heart, is always rejoicing, rejoices always. Now, the Baal Shem Tov explains that this idea of I place God before me always, this is teaching the, 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 the soul quality, the quality of soul called equanimity. Shivis is from the word shave, hishtavut, to be equal. In other words, to be equal no matter what happens, no matter what the circumstances that I find myself in, no matter what's going on, I'm always in a state of equanimity, hishtavut. It's, it's okay because it's all in God's hands anyway. I have no influence over it. I have no, um, no control over what happens and what goes on around me, of the circumstances of everything. And uh, therefore, um, I would say that uh, shiviti, says the Baal Shem Tov, Shiviti means this idea of equanimity, that whether it looks good, whether it looks bad, it's all okay. It's all good. There's a story of a certain sage whose name was Nahum Ish Gamzu. Now, he, play, he came from a town called Gamzu, but they also called him Gamzu because the word Gamzu means this too, he would always say, this too is for the good. Gamzu tova. This too is for the good. No matter how bad things appeared, he would always say, this too is for the good. That's the concept of shiviti, of equanimity. So the morning sacrifice, therefore, is the sacrifice which begins the day. It begins the, the Shulchan Aruch or Achaim. And that's the one of... I'm always going to be equal before God. In other words, always be in a state of equanimity before God because he's the one in control. The last verse which closes the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, is again, Tov Lev, Mishta Tamid, someone of good heart is always celebrating, is always making a feast, is always feasting, making a, making, a, making a celebration. The feast is not the main thing, but the celebration is the main thing. It's also a verse, a verse in Mishlei, Proverbs. Someone of good cheer, of good heart, is always making a party, basically. Which means, um, if, we, if we just extract that, extract the core, the kernel of the whole thing, it means to be in a state of simcha, to be in a state of joy. So equanimity and joy, these are the two things which are the tikkun that a, an, an impregnated, that a leap year, an impregnated year brings us. It brings us the teaching of equanimity and the teaching of joy. To be in a state of constant equanimity and to be in a state of constant joy. 
the sinking of the sun and the moon is the sinking of these two things. The sun represents that first quality of God is always, I'm always uh, in a state of equanimity before God. God doesn't change. Ani, Avaya, Loshanisi, I'm God who doesn't change. The verse. So that concept of, of, of equanimity, because God is unchanging, I too, in my mood, I will always be in a state of unchanging of equanimity. Um, yeah, correct. That's right, uh, added in Radla over here, that's correct. In any event, that is the top-down, the top-down model, the sun model, the model of the sun, the way the sun shines top-down, that's Shivisi Hashem le Negdi Tomit. I always place God before me, He's in front of me, He's there, He's in my life, He's in the, I'm, I'm in His presence essentially. And therefore I'm in a state of equanimity, but that's always there, it's always there. Tov Lev Mishta Tomit is something that we have to do, it's the bottom up model. It's the moon model, as opposed to the sun model. It's I have to do something I have to make a celebration. I have to put myself in a mood of simcha, in a mood of joy. Now, of course, one affects the other. The fact that I have feel this equanimity puts me in a state of joy. But it also works the other way. The fact that I'm in a state of joy makes me feel the equanimity even more. Um, yes, I would say that is correct, uh, Dennis. We say that we're in a state of equanimity with the Creator, we'll be in a blessed relationship with Him. Yes, correct. So therefore, these two, these are the two sacrifices, these are the two offerings that a person has to, has to bring. To be aware constantly of the presence of God and that He's in control. And therefore, I don't have to worry about anything. I'm in a state of equanimity. And to generate a feeling of joy, what do they call it in uh, the, um, the French, joy de vivre, yeah, the joy of life, the joy of being alive, the joy of just being able to, uh, to, to wake up in the morning or go to bed at night with a smile on your face, feeling happy. You're delighted that, you're delighted to be alive, you're delighted to, uh, now, delighted to be alive doesn't mean to say that you you know maybe your bones ache a little bit if you're getting a little bit older, or maybe you got a cold, or maybe uh, you know you have some worries here and there. But the way to overcome um, the way to overcome those worries is not with a sort of foolhardy, uh, you know, sort of foolish, uh, just laughing at everything, but to feel a feel to feel a real joy, a joy in the little things in life, to be able to feel the sunlight on your face in the morning. In Chicago, that's quite a big thing. I'm not sure it's so, so much so in Florida, but um, in any event, just the little things in life, the little, those little things which, which, if we would stop to think about it for a minute, would give a person tremendous pleasure and, and joy. Those are the things that, uh, that are really the tikkun that is required. The tikkun of sinking the sun aspect and the moon aspect. If we can have those two things in our lives, that the synchronization of hishtavut, equanimity, and joy, the joy of life, if we bring those two things into sync, in other words, those should be constant, constantly syncing with each other, synchronizing with each other, then life will turn out to be a completely different party altogether. Okay, any questions? Right, the sun projects and activates, shoes, but the moon receives this. Right, exactly. That's exactly right. Now, where did that come from? Okay. Um, all right, are there any questions? <laughs> 